Well, good evening and thank you for tuning in to the Alliance for Unity's fifth Monday night broadcast. Uh, the, this is going out on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And while those three media are sinking, I can tell you that the Alliance for Unity now has over 15,000 followers on Twitter in just five weeks. We now have a bigger following than the Scottish Liberal Democrats. My name is Jamie Blackett and I am the Deputy Leader of the Alliance for Unity and I also speak on agriculture and environment for the Alliance. It's become traditional on these Monday night broadcasts to talk about uh, our backgrounds and what led us to join the Alliance for Unity. You've heard from our leader, George Galloway, from Alan Sked and from David Griffiths. Tonight, it's my turn. I am not a career politician. I have never stood for office before and so forgive any lack of polish. I was 20 years a soldier and since then for 20 years I've been a farmer and I've also had an additional career as a writer and journalist. I was born in London. My father was Scottish, my mother was English but had a Scottish granny. I think in the eyes of some in the Sturgeon cult. That makes me some kind of mudblood, but I believe Nicola Sturgeon has just revealed that she has an English granny, so nobody is perfect. I grew up where I live now in what was in those days the Stuartry of Kukubri in southwest Scotland, and I'll get the bad news out of the way first. I was sent south to Eton to be educated, so if you've got your rotten eggs ready, now is the time to throw them. Yes, I am an Etonian. My father, I think, hoped that I would win a scholarship. I was the eldest of five. Unfortunately, I didn't do that. They did give one to a boy in my class with very bright, fair hair named Johnson. Boris Johnson, as we know, went off and... Uh, had a stellar career in journalism and politics. I'm afraid I rather squandered the opportunity I was given and wasted my time at school. <clears throat> I didn't probably learn very much. What I did learn was thanks to a remarkable man named Michael Kidson, who was my tutor, who saved my career. And I later wrote a book about him, which is currently being turned into a play for the West End stage. So you may hear more about him in a year or so's time. I didn't stay on like many of my contemporaries for the extra term that we had to do in those days to sit the Oxbridge exam. I went uh, straight into the army, giving up a place at Edinburgh University and joined the army as a private soldier at the Guards Depot at Purbright. Shortly after that, I passed the regular commissions board and went to Sandhurst. So within two years of leaving school, aged 19, I found myself in the Falkland Islands as the platoon commander of 30 young men. I don't think those young men learnt very much from this uh, public schoolboy who'd been parachuted in to command them. I was barely shaving in those days, but uh, I certainly learned an awful lot from them. It was the, at the height of the miners' strike. Most of them came from mining families and they were all sending money home to their families as their fathers and brothers were on strike. It taught me an awful lot about life and it gave me a completely different perspective on Mrs Thatcher's Britain and the uh, post-industrial strategy or lack of it and how it affects people in Britain even to today. <clears throat> and I completely understand why people in Scotland are still reluctant to vote Tory or even to make common cause with the Tories, which is something that the Alliance for Unity 
is asking everybody to do now. Uh, after that uh, first posting in the Falkland Islands, I went to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was in those days still a British colony. We were the garrison there. And in fact, it wasn't so much a British colony as a Scottish colony. It had largely been founded by Scots in one of the most disgraceful periods of British imperial history, the Opium Wars with China. But uh, since then, in the 150 years up until 1997, when we handed it back, uh, I think uh, Britain, and particularly Scotland, as part of the British Empire, had a very benevolent impact on the colony. Its uh, greatest administrator was a Scot named John Cooperthwaite, perhaps the best economist to come out of Scotland since Adam Smith. It was thanks to him that once the Japanese were booted out in 1945, that the uh, colony became the hugely important economy that it is today. And I think it's a source of pride that 20, over 20 years since we left Hong Kong, so many Hong Kong Chinese wish to have a British passport and to come and settle in Britain. What must those Hong Kong Chinese think about Nicola Sturgeon and her separatist friends wanting to give up British passports with all the security that that implies? They must think we're mad. I think we are mad, anybody who thinks that. It's striking that anybody who served in the British Armed Forces doesn't buy the separatist argument or rarely do so. It's the same with athletes who have been part of Team GB in the Olympics. I think the separatists need to get out more. If they went beyond Britain, beyond Europe and looked back at Scotland, they would see uh, the vital part that Scotland plays in Britain and how important Britain is in the world. Over the next 20 years that I served in the army, I saw that Britain is a force for good in the world. As a staff officer, I played a small part in several of Blair's wars. <clears throat> in Kosovo and Sierra Leone, I was part of the campaign planning team and deployed to each theater briefly to um, help set things up. Both of those operations were resounding successes and uh, I, I have a sense of pride in what was achieved. I also served on a British military training team in the African bush on the Zimbabwe-Mozambique border. This was an initiative set up by Mrs Thatcher to help to bring to an end the bitter civil war that had gone on there between Renamo and Frelimo, or in the British military slang, as we called them, Ronnies and Freddies. Well, the Ronnies, uh, Renamo, arrived by Russian Antonov with their AK-47 still loaded. Frelimo, who were the government forces, uh, also arrived, and we had the job of merging the two together. Many of them had been child soldiers, and they had been murdering each other for many years. Again, it's a source of, of pride what was achieved. Mozambique uh, even went as far a few years later to apply to join the British Commonwealth, uniquely having not been a British colony. And the Mozambican army, which was half Renamo and half Frelimo initially, has been a great success and a force for good in the region. Perhaps the, uh, the most seminal experiences, though, of my military career were in the first Gulf War and serving uh, on two tours in Northern Ireland. During the Gulf War, I have um, a very striking memory of being uh, in the desert, uh, driving through the minefield into Iraq and 
finding these uh, Iraqi soldiers coming towards us with their hands up. We were overwhelmed with the number of prisoners that we were taking and we had to stop and set up a field kitchen to feed them all. They hadn't been fed for nine days because we had been bombarding them. A, a surprising number of them spoke English and many of them said that they'd been told by their commanders, whatever you do, surrender to the British as you will be treated fairly. And I remember being struck that here we were on a battlefield in the middle of a sandstorm in the desert. And here were our enemies having a respect and uh, acknowledging British values of fair play and tolerance. We had a, a team photograph the next day of Sandhurst old boys, half of whom were Iraqi. Yes, Britain had even been training the officer corps of the Iraqi army. So I get very angry when I hear young people in Scotland using the language of Sinn Féin IRA and talking about Brits and Brit Nats, because Britain means so much more than that. And it was in Northern Ireland that uh, I started really to think deeply about Scotland, or at least since I've moved back to Scotland, I've thought deeply about Northern Ireland. George Galloway, our leader, was, of course, not to put too fine a point on it, on the other side of the barricades, figuratively speaking, during that campaign. He's made no secret of his support throughout his life for United Ireland. I served two tours in Northern Ireland as an intelligence officer in Belfast and as a company commander in Bandit Country down in South Armagh, where I was responsible for six parishes along the Irish border. George and I have spoken about that time, and we're both extremely worried about the Ulsterisation of Scotland. When I was an intelligence officer, I had a copy of Anne Flabacht, the Sinn Féin newspaper, on my desk at all times. People didn't talk about postmodernism post in those days, but they used all the postmodernist techniques of fake news and fake history to get their point across. And it is striking how similar the nationalist newspaper the national is today. It is why people believe the lies they are told about the union. It's why they believe that Scotland pays more into the British budget than we get out. It's why they don't believe the jurors figures. And I also remember the uh, democracy in Northern Ireland, particularly at the time of elections when soldiers and helicopter pilots risked their lives to make sure that polling stations were secure, people could cast their votes without intimidation, and the ballot boxes were sealed and taken to be counted. Well, at the moment, we are seeing the SNP taking steps to register children as young as 14 on electoral rolls. And we're seeing them take steps to allow people with no fixed addresses to, again, register to vote. Why would they do that? Perhaps the most worrying thing, though, is the civil unrest that is starting to be seen in Scotland. The unrest that we saw in Glasgow with statues being hauled down in George Square. The protests on the border. George and I both feel that this is how it starts and that it must be stopped. And the only way to do that is to defeat nationalism once and for all in the polls next May. The other thing I remember about Northern Ireland is partition. And we are looking at the partition, not just of Britain, but also of Scotland. 
vote separation, get partition. It's a taboo subject that other political parties won't address. But a generation ago, a question was posed by Tam Diel, the West Lothian question, to which an answer, as far as I can see, has yet to be found. Well, I'm going to pose another question, the Dumfries and Galloway question. If a region of Scotland votes to be to remain part of the United Kingdom, why should they be dragged out of the United Kingdom against their will? Dumfries and Galloway, the borders, possibly Edinburgh, Orkney, Shetland. If there was ever a vote for separation, presumably thanks to the numbers of people in Glasgow and Dundee voting that way, don't think that we would come quietly. Don't think that we would not do exactly what Nicola Sturgeon has tried to do over Brexit. We would fight tooth and nail through the courts to stay British. I left the army and came home to be a farmer. I wouldn't claim to be a very good or knowledgeable farmer, but having been uh, an arable beef and now dairy farmer for 20 years now, I think that I understand many of the problems facing farming and the rural economy. The main one is that our brand has been trashed. Farming families over many generations have built up strong brands for Scotch beef and Scotch tourism, Scottish tourism, which I'm also involved with here. Our customers are mostly English. 70% of Scotch beef goes south, to, to mainly to English supermarkets, and roughly the same proportion of our tourists come from England. How do you think we feel, Nicola Sturgeon, when that brand is trashed? Trashed by idiots on the border, telling English people that they're not welcome to come, and trashed also by Ian Blackford, the champagne separatist, the multi-millionaire merchant banker turned crofter, who has gone to Westminster specifically to antagonise the English, or so it seems. A man whose expense account each year would probably feed and clothe 20 Scottish families, who delights in rubbing the English noses in Scotland's reluctance to leave the EU, who goes out of his way to make life difficult. The Scottish government, so-called, makes a great play of standing up for Scottish farmers. And in fairness to Fergus Ewing, I think he genuinely does have Scottish farming at heart and he has been a good farming minister. But some bad things have been happening. The Scottish government has allowed a small cartel of mostly Irish-owned businesses to take over the meat processing industry so that the farmer share of the retail price has fallen to record lows beyond uh, below um, viable levels in many cases. And the SNP have tried to make the Saltar their own. They treat our flag in the same way as Sinn Féin IRA treated the Irish tricolor. And yet they allow beef from all parts of the world to come into Scotland, to be packaged in Scotland, and then have a saltar put on it put before it's put on the supermarket shelves. That undermines our market and again has made beef farming uh, almost unprofitable for many people. Like many businessmen, I am deeply worried about separation. Like most farmers, I have a big mortgage. That mortgage is in sterling. What would happen if I was paid in sturgeons or whatever else we call the new Scottish currency? Our debts would double 
possibly treble with a weak currency. I've also seen at close, close up how the SNP's partners, the Scottish Greens, the SNP gardening section, as George calls them, how they really uh, have treated the environment in Scotland. Scottish wildlife is in a bad way at the moment. Salmon are disappearing from our rivers. Red squirrels are becoming extinct. So are curlews and many other native birds. Scottish Greens have done nothing to help them. All they have done is prop up the SNP in power. All they are is a separatist party, a deeply socialist separatist party with a thin green cover. As I said earlier, I then branched out into writing and journalism as well as my farming activities. And this brought me to Twitter. I was encouraged to get on Twitter to promote my books uh, and to engage with other journalists. It was there I, I came across the dissident intelligentsia who were starting to question what is happening in Scotland. In many cases, doing the job of the media. Many of them highly intelligent academics, many of them women uh, writing under pseudonyms to hide their identity. Very brave people. And there's been, been some bad stuff happening in Scotland. Restrictions on free speech, attempts to interpose the state between parents and their children. These people have stood up against that. And it is against that backdrop that the Alliance for Unity, this new party, has been formed. Formed to represent the majority, the silent majority of people who don't go along with the SNP's plans, but perhaps also don't speak out. The problem we have is that that silent majority is split three ways. The Conservatives, Labour and Liberal parties each have a strong share of the pro-union vote. And it's for that reason that the SNP, although they have never in any vote actually got much above 45% of the popular vote for separation, nevertheless seem to win most of the seats. And that is what the Alliance for Unity has been set up to do not to replace any of those parties, but to help to bring them together to stand one candidate, one pro-union candidate in each seat to defeat the SNP. And I want to say a little bit about George Galloway, our leader. As I've alluded to earlier, George and I are poles apart on many of our politics but we completely agree on the need to keep Britain together. Uh, an elder statesman in the Conservative Party wrote to me recently, warning me that George was a dangerous demagogue. Well, I think there's a lot more to George than that, although he's certainly a very powerful orator. But if he is a dangerous demagogue, then he's our dangerous demagogue and he's exactly the right man to spearhead the campaign to send another dangerous demagogue packing in May. And the leadership that he has brought to this campaign has really raised morale, I think, in the unionist camp. I didn't go to university, as I said before, and at Sandhurst, I remember we were taught the principles of war, which have stuck with me ever since. The first of these is the selection and maintenance of the aim. You hear some pro-union parties saying that they aim to be the best opposition after the next election. Well, we're not gonna be anybody's opposition after May in the Alliance for Unity. Our aim is to defeat the SNP and the Green allies 
so comprehensively in May that we enable a government of national unity and end the neverendum over the in independence question for good. The second principle war of war is the maintenance of morale. And I don't know about you, but my morale has gone up a lot since George took over. It's often linked to another principle, offensive action. And the fact that George Galloway has put the Alliance for Unity's tanks on Nicola Sturgeon's lawn has definitely changed the campaign in my view. But the most important principle in this context is the concentration of force. The Conservatives, Labour and Liberals, the so-called Cowden Beef parties, cannot win on their own. They have to fight together or they will fail. Apologies to any Cowden Beef fans who are listening in, but in the words of Effie Deans, probably the best of all political bloggers today in Scotland, the Conservatives, Labour and Liberals taking on the SNP on their own would be like Cowden Beef taking on Real Madrid or Barcelona. They cannot win on their own. They have to come together. We've looked at it and we reckon that if they follow our prescription, the pro-union side of the argument can win 88 seats out of 129 next May. But everybody has to understand that the vital ground in this battle, the battle for Britain, and it really will be the battle for Britain next year, the vital ground is the union and not any one particular party's continuation or uh, ability to win a share of the vote. We need to unite to win. And we need to imagine waking up next spring after the election in May, listening to the dawn chorus and knowing that Nicola Sturgeon is no longer in Butte House and that there's a government of national unity in Holyrood. We can make that a reality if you, we unite. This broadcast is going out on Twitter, on Facebook and on YouTube. If you like what you've heard, please share it. Please tell people to join the Alliance for Unity and please tell people to tell their MSPs this simple message, unite or fail. Thank you for listening.